It's, it's, it's true, friends. Uh, our guest here at one time was uh, referred to by the RCMP as Canada's most uh, dangerous criminal. Uh, he spent 21 years of his life behind bars. Uh, his story is uh, the stuff of fiction. I, you read his book and it, you just, you're a gog. It's called Untwisted, From Lawbreaker to Lawmaker. There it is, the autobiography, uh, the autobiography of Serge Leclerc, who now is an MLA. Can you believe it, Serge? You are no. now <laughs> a member of the Legislative Assembly for Saskatchewan. You are uh, a, a secretary for corrections. You, Lead you secretary. Uh, that's right. And you, you report directly to Brad Wall, the premier. Well, he appointed me uh, for a special task to, yeah. to look at our correctional system in Saskatchewan. And I then embarked upon the rest of Canada, toured Ontario and, and, and Alberta and Manitoba to, to look at what they were doing to address the, specifically the gang problem and the addiction problem um, with our young people and in our correctional system. And, it, and of course, it's an epidemic across Canada. Yeah and um, just uh, finished my report a little while ago and we've begun to move on it to address the needs within our system and one of the uh, main focuses, uh, one of the first focuses I uh, presented to the Premier and, and to the Minister for the Change uh, is to hire full-time chaplains, right. two for each prison, and to begin to coordinate with Christian volunteers and in the community and then hire three elders because we have such a high native population right. in our province to begin to address the spiritual cultural necessity for change because uh, a change it has to come with a, a faith, a spiritual journey. Yeah. Um, otherwise, change will not happen. Any, any, uh, any possibility of what you're doing in Saskatchewan might spill over to other provinces? Well, I'm hoping, and, uh, and I've had the opportunity to talk uh, with a number of the federal MPs, and, and I'm hoping that uh, over time they understand that if we're going to talk about rehabilitation, we need to understand the essence of what that means. And rehabilitation means the change into a former state. Over 80% of the adults in the federal correctional systems uh, of Canada started in juvenile custody. So you can't change back to a former state because they were dysfunctional children. We need to habilitate, right. to, to renew and restructure and... Uh, and, and, and we need that spiritual connection uh, for the emotional energy as we begin to knock down the walls of our addictions. For instance, I was a 20-year drug addict and 97% of the, of the correctional system of Canada have addiction problems. Yeah. You know, I'm listening to this and uh, I, I, I believe it, but it's hard to believe. Having just read your book, I mean, you, you played truant one day you're eight years of age, yeah. and the next thing you know, you're in St. John's Correctional f School. Training school. Training school up in Oxbridge, Ontario. Which turned out to be the most violent and brutal training school in the history of Canada. Uh, yeah, with, with the Christian brothers of all people. And uh, it's under the Juvenile Delinquency Act of the time, the social engineers had uh, basically come to the premise that you know, you were poor because you were lazy yeah. uh, and you didn't have values. And if you were a boy child and you had a single mother, uh, that mothers were incapable of handling strong-willed male children. Plus you had native blood. I had native blood. My mother was Cree. Yeah. And, and so under the Juvenile Delinquency Act, they actually allowed you to be incarcerated from the age of seven to the age of 21 for non-criminal offenses under the status offenses, uh, truancy, having sex under age, going to pool halls uh, under age. When yeah. the, the age limit was 18, so if you want, you know, now they're family entertainment centers, yeah. or drinking under age. Yeah. And so basically what happened was they took a look at my mother, who was illiterate. Uh, she was First Nation. I was a product of rape, so there was no family connections. You were listed as a bastard. I was listed as a bastard. Yeah. And, uh, and so they presumed that it was the state's duty to, to take care of me or to raise me. And, and they put me in St. John's Training School. And uh, I became a go boy, um, a runaway. Uh, yeah, a runaway. And, uh, and I did something that was very unique for the time. So I ran to the other districts in Toronto. I asked the kids, you know, where do you live? 
Where's your gang? Who do you, where's the best dairies? Where's the bakeries? Best places to steal? Where are the abandoned buildings? And I began to go into different areas of the city. Yeah, and you're nine, ten years of age. I, yeah. I mean, you even, for, for one uh, period of time, were, had a lovely little den at Casa Loma. Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the movie rights to the book have just been bought, and wow. uh, and and one of the scenes they want to do is the Castle Loma scene. The Castle Loma scene. scene. I lived in a, I guess it was an underground passageway that went to the main house, and I stole from the dairy across the street, and I'd go to the fountain, and I guess they had little wedding receptions, and people would throw a change in the fountains. Well, I'd dive about three o'clock in the morning, get my sh my bath, and. They got all of the shot, all of the coins at the bottom of the fountain. But at this early age, occasionally you'd be caught, you go back in, then you escape again. You'd be caught, you escape again. Uh, you were really establishing a DNA for a life of crime. I mean, you you were learning to become really street smart, and you were very entrepreneurial. Well, and I very quickly understood that people uh, respect money. They love money. Yeah. Uh, I had a knack for figuring out angles on how to make it. I also realized that if people were scared of you, uh, it was protection. Right. And, and that it, it to always go on the offense and put people at the defense. Um, and what was, because I was so baby-faced, and I mean, I didn't shave till I was 23, yeah. it put people really at a defense because they never expected me to be as violent as I was. Yeah. And, uh, and I learned that people will follow people they're scared of. They also follow people that have a knack for making money. Mm -hmm. um, and so by the time I was 15... You, you, you were heading up gangs. At, by the I time was heading up gangs. Yeah. And, uh, and controlling I'd been a whole I'd area been, of trial. Yeah, I was labeled brain damaged at 10 for stabbing yeah. my first man. Yeah. I irreparably brain damaged at 12, which gave an extra edge to me as a gang leader. And by the time I was 15, I was leading gang. I was running extortion rackets, uh, alcohol stills. I discovered simple premises that bars in the west end of Toronto would rather buy my raw potato mash moonshine than buy it from Seagram's because Seagram's wouldn't burn their bar down, I would. Hmm. So general principles of <laughs> a business. Yeah, yeah, you were a master of extortion. Um, and, and then in and out of jail. Uh, and, and then you got, you got into, uh, you made a lot of money with drugs.